Welcome to the latest episode of our podcast series for financial advisors. Today's episode is Fintech Disruptors, the CEO of eMoney on how to elevate the planning experience. It's a conversation with Susan McKenna, the CEO of eMoney. I'm Jason Diamond, and this is the Diamond Podcast for Financial Advisors. At Diamond Consultants, our mission is to help advisors live their best business life. We want every elite advisor to find exactly the right place for their business and their clients to thrive, whether it's at a wirehouse, a regional, boutique, or independent firm. As the industry's leading recruiters and consultants, we've transitioned more than a quarter of a trillion dollars in assets under management in the past decade, and each year, 25% of transitioning advisors who manage a billion dollars or more are our clients. If you'd like to talk, please feel free to give us a call at 908-879-1002. Are you a financial advisor who's curious about whether you're in the best place to serve clients or if there might be a better way to optimize your business for the future? Should I Stay or Should I Go is a new book that serves as a self-guided journey, walking you through the key steps that Diamond Consultants takes with our advisor clients whether considering change or not. Visit diamond-consultants.com slash the book to learn more. It goes without saying, technology has been a mass disruptor in every industry. In wealth management, fintech, as it's referred to, has set the foundation for growth and efficiency, with companies like eMoney leading the charge. Nearly 25 years ago, eMoney Advisor hit the scene as a tool to make advisors more efficient by leveraging the internet with a platform of tools that allowed clients to access a living, breathing plan, as opposed to a binder of documents that quickly became stale after delivery. Today, eMoney continues to foster the goal of helping advisors and their clients talk about money with a full suite of tools designed to empower financial advisors and elevate the client experience. No doubt that's a condensed version of what makes eMoney the success that it is today. So I'm excited to welcome eMoney CEO, Susan McKenna, to share their story from past to present and into the future. Susan joined eMoney in 2018 and served as head of marketing and sales before being named CEO in 2022. She has a world of experience in the financial space and technology, and a great knack for sharing a unique perspective on eMoney, the wealth management and planning world, and technology's role within it. So let's jump in and have Susan tell it her way. Susan, thanks so much for joining me. Thrilled to have you on the show. Jason, I am thrilled to be here. Nice to meet you. Likewise. So to start with, can you tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and your journey to eMoney? Sure. So I've spent decades in the technology space. It's what I love to do. Software, services, sometimes both, sometimes exclusively from angel-invested startups all the way up to these behemoths like Deloitte and IBM before I landed here at eMoney. And on the personal side, I am the proud mother of four adult children. I love to cook, and I am a lifelong Philadelphia Eagles fan. Oh, no. We might have some issues moving forward here. But... <laughs> I think you're green light. <laughs> We're going to try and put that one aside for now. So I want to spend most of our time today talking about e-money because our audience is mainly financial advisors, and I think that will be the meat of the conversation. But it's interesting, and you just alluded to it, your background is primarily in the tech or software as a service space. Did you find that there was a steep learning curve in understanding the mindset of an advisor and what makes advisors tick? Or do you view your role as, I'm a tech CEO and my job is to make the very best possible tech and it's up to them to decide how to leverage and employ it? The answer is yes. No, I'm kidding. (laughs) My career is always really focus deeply on the customer relationship. So there's, of course, a learning curve. I've supported financial services over the years in a number of different software and services organizations. So I wasn't sure that I was going to end up in the financial planning space, but I definitely know it's where I'm supposed to be. At eMoney, I feel like we focus on creating this exceptional technology, but we also know that it's imperative that we teach our advisors how to best leverage it. So it's one of the things that I'll keep coming back to here because I think it's a big differentiator for us. And anytime we have a sale or start a relationship, it's really about the beginning of a long partnership with our clients. 
And we have a number of amazing resources to ensure that they get the most out of our solutions. So we want to make sure they're successful. That's one of the best ways to do that. We're really proud to serve the best in the industry. And we do that a lot of different ways, coaching and training. And we offer CE credits. We have a lot of thought leadership. We do an annual summit. We feel like that back and forth between our clients and ourselves helps us help them. Yeah, I think that's a really nice answer. And I probably should have started here, but, and honestly, I didn't because I think e-money has become a household name like Kleenex in the wealth management space. But for the uninitiated, can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about how you define e-money? What is the value prop? And maybe give us some statistics or even just some context around size of target market you serve and who you serve. Sure. First of all, I love that you're branding us right up there with Kleenex. So that makes me happy. But um, we have been an industry leader focused on planning for almost 25 years. And not just on planning, but I would say changing, transforming the financial planning experience and decades behind us in doing it. So we have a very simple mission, simple but significant, I would say. It's helping people talk about money. And our vision, and I remember when we created this in a small conference room a number of years ago to simplify things was financial peace of mind for all. Should be lofty, should be aspirational, but I feel like it is achievable. We take a lot of pride in the industry and we really look at the financial planning industry as a profession that helps our advisors really care about their clients and they want to help make an impact in their clients' lives. So it's really our job, it's our passion to provide financial planning solutions that support them in firms of all different sizes, no matter how simple, no matter how complex. You ask for some stats. We currently serve over more than 109,000 financial professionals in the United States. Wow. And we've got a really diverse client base. We serve very large enterprise organizations, some of the top broker dealers, banks, financial institutions, home offices, individual RIAs, and we've become a popular choice among breakaways. So this kind of diversity is something that's amazing. We learn from them and we're able to fulfill specific needs in each of these organizations to help them grow through planning. I love the loftiness of the goals and I love the kind of nobility of the message there as well around just basically making people's lives better. And this is such an important topic. Financial planning is we use that term and it gets a little bit trite and overused. But when you think about what it really means, this is people's livelihood and people's ability to retire. But I wanted to ask because I would imagine, and you would know better than me, that your competitive landscape, but a lot of fintech companies probably share elements of that value prop. Certainly like Money Guide Pro comes to mind. It's a pretty crowded sea of financial planning, fintech kind of providers. How do you view e-money as a differentiator? Like, How do you stand out in this crowded sea? I think that's fair. Obviously, our competitors try and capture these things too. I'm clearly biased. There are a lot of choices in this vertical. I don't think any of them focus on financial planning quite the way that we do with the same level of commitment that we have to our clients. We talked about 25 years, but we've always had that same North Star. How do we transform the planning experience? We have a deep value for innovation, and we definitely have explored areas outside of planning in an attempt to better understand the market, but we always come back to planning. So the past few years, we have really spent time with our clients because they're transforming as well and figuring out how we can make our software better. And we've had some really exciting updates based on their feedback. We also conduct research all the time. This is a luxury I have not always had in other companies to have the opportunity to test and conduct research to make sure that our solutions provide the most value, which I think is a big differentiator for us as well. And also looking at what makes the planning process seamless. And one of the things that I think is unique is our aggregation. We have our own aggregation engine at eMoney. We don't rely on a third party. So it's not just that we offer it, but it's the quality of our aggregation that is a big strength. Yeah. And the numbers so certainly speak for themselves with the success you've had in, in cornering this market. And as I said, it's clearly become a, a household name. 
I like this quote from your website. You say, e-money takes the fear out of talking about money by making it actionable. Can you tell me a little bit about what you mean by that and maybe walk me through? So what's a typical use case? So you're a financial planner or an advisor and I'm a client. Talk to me about how I might leverage e-money to, quote, take the fear out of talking about money and making it actionable. I think that's a great question. We look at this holistically because we're really committed to enhancing the user experience, not just for the advisor, but for the end client. So a lot of the recent product updates that I was talking about have been designed specifically around that goal. And that's everything from a more modern aesthetic to updates to our decision center, which is really our hub. That's the home base of the planning conversations. And it's designed for however you can most incent engagement with your clients. So there's charts, there's visualizers, there's components that you're able to customize to really have this collaborative planning experience. So they all are designed to facilitate this planning conversation that gets to the heart of what matters most to the client. So using those tools in Decision Center, they can show the client real time the impact of their decisions, which helps them take action. I'm just seeing the visual now of some of these video case studies we've done where we're watching our clients, our advisors, sit there with their clients and showing things real time on the screen and discussing different scenarios and then seeing the real time impact of what's going to happen if I go this way or that way. So the collaboration that really gets enhanced by using tools like this. And I would imagine that a lot of the innovations or new rollouts or enhancements you make are driven by conversations that you and your team have with advisors. To me, that would be the best way to what matters to advisors and clients is to ask them. Is that fair? Is that a part of the process? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I figured because that to me seems like the most logical kind of jumping off point. And is it fair to say that many advisors are using this tool differently? Are there various different bells and whistles and you leave it up to the advisor to determine how and to what degree we want to leverage this? Or is your view that there's more kind of a cohesive use case for e-money and everybody's using it similarly? No, I would say it's a very diverse set of use cases. Like mm -hmm. I said, so we can have individual advisors or advisors at small firms or advisors that are part of a home office or these large enterprises. And so you look at growing your business is still fundamental. And so if you're an individual advisor trying to optimize this experience and figure out, you might have a very different book of business today than you will five years from now. And so mm -hmm. you might be tapping into different aspects of the software today. And then as your business grows, as your clientele grows, and as they grow, you're going to start using different aspects of the solution. And we have to be able to flex with that and continue to understand that segmented uh, base that we have and how to best serve their needs. So I, I love that answer. And you just mentioned growth. And this is, I think, one of the most interesting and important concepts that we hear from our advisor clients every single day is they're balancing dual mandates or dual um, goals. So on the one hand, it's certainly growth. But the other right. hand is capacity. And a lot of advisors yeah. struggle with, especially, honestly, I was going to say wirehouse advisors, but I think it's true business owners and independent advisors as well. I think all advisors to varying degrees struggle with balancing capacity, but still that mission for growth. How do you view e-money as helping to deepen that advisor-client relationship and to solve for that dual mandate that I just described? And if you'd like to broaden it and talk about how kind of fintech as a whole solves for that, that'd be fine as well. But I'm curious specific to e-money as well. Yeah, I think I come back to collaborative planning here, but making the planning process scalable and repeatable is really at the core of the customer journey. But our advisors are using planning for prospecting to get that conversation started and they rely on it for identifying new opportunities along the way. So when you talk about growth, it's what are the things fundamentally we can sit down and discuss together that are really going to open up that conversation, right? It's a scary thing. People, it's emotional. People don't always like to talk about money. And there are ways that you can ease into it using some of the tools we've talked about. And that collaborative planning experience really does deepen the relationship and encourages trust. And it helps attract new clients as well. We've seen that over and over. So advisors use the tools as an instigator for the discussion. They collaborate. 
the trust is there, and they're able to build and accommodate those needs for growth. I think that's a very clear cut answer that it's a growth tool, obviously, on the prospecting side of things. But as it relates to managing the existing book of business and doing even just core planning functions, it's obviously an industry leading software for that as well. So I think this is the perfect example of the quintessential dual mandate software where you're helping advisors solve for growth, but also if utilized properly, helping them to solve for capacity constraints as well. Exactly. Spot on. Let me ask you another question. I just thought of this as we're talking because I'm thinking through like the Apple example where they're very minimalist and in the background in terms of design. And I had an advisor say something to me, the nicest thing I can say about my tech is nothing. And he meant it as a compliment. I'm not complaining. (laughs) The tech works just fine. Is that your view of fintech and e-money is that it just is something that when it's at its best should just sit in the background and do its job, but not be flashy kind of bells and whistles? Or do you view this as something more, something different? That's the equivalent of calling your baby ugly. (laughs) Let me me think about this. I think both of those things can be true in that I sitting there in the background wanting to be able to depend on your software. That's a given to me. I feel like in this industry, the service and support that we provide at eMoney is something that we continue to invest in. It's definitely a differentiator for us, but it's something that we know our advisors need to be able to rely on. On the other hand, if you say to me, what about the bells and whistles? We have a very high end sophisticated technology. Mm -hmm. Not everybody is going to use it much like Apple. I know I scratched the surface on what my iPhone can do on a daily basis, but it definitely serves my needs. But I also know there's more there if I need it. I would say the same for e-money and the same for a lot of our advisors. They know they're going to grow with it over time. As their clientele changes and as their clients' needs change, many of them have been working with folks for 5, 10, 15, or even decades. And then you start looking at, okay, I wasn't thinking about estate planning when we started doing business together 15 years ago, but it's really important for me now. Any money can accommodate that. So I think it ebbs and flows. I think for some people, it's just there in the background serving needs, and for others, It needs to be very robust and it changes over time. Yeah, I I actually love the parallel to Apple there, which I know I teed up unintentionally. I I think that's spot on. I'm thinking through the way I I totally agree. There's elements of it where I know for a fact I'm only scratching the surface, but that's okay with me because I know then if a need arises down down the line, you have those capabilities. They'll help me as my business. That's one of the things we talk with advisors about all the time is that Your business is a living, breathing thing and the needs of the business and the needs of your clients will evolve over time. And so we talk obviously a lot through the lens of due diligence and diligencing the street or options outside of your current firm. I think it's equally important to diligence your current firm, your home to say, my business has evolved, has my technology and my solution set kept pace. Exactly. All right, let's look at your personal journey now with eMoney. So I believe you joined the company in 2018 prior to becoming CEO in 2022. And I'm curious, obviously, those were some uh, busy years with the pandemic and a number of pretty seminal changes in our industry. Can you talk to me about what has changed both in the company and maybe just your perception even streetwide since you either joined the company in 2018 or became CEO in 2022? Yeah. So you're right. Crazy years, crazy journey. I think a lot has changed in money, but also in the industry in that time, you alluded to it, right? COVID happened. Fortunately, we were ready for that. We were already set up for flexible work. It was something that we launched in 2018. Wow. So we now operate as a fully remote company with employees in over 40 states. So we've had to bob and weave with that, but we were really ready for it. I think our culture supports that and we operate very efficiently and effectively in that environment. Still very much value in-person experiences and we do that across the organization and with our business units and, and certainly with our clients, but are able to operate in this capacity because of the way we set things up. I think also looking at our employee engagement rate, it's really high. I'm very grateful that our employee engagement rate is over 80%. And we've seen just incredibly low turnover over the last couple of years. Just as importantly, 
We focus on this in so many ways. I've already talked about some of them, but our client SAT ratings are at an all-time high. So looking at everything from our CSAT scores to their experiences with the money, they're in the high 90s as well as issue resolution and things like that. So I'm incredibly proud of our team for contributing to those things. And they've been some of the most fundamental changes over the past three years, few years. I also think we've been able to turn some of these pain points that people experienced into big strengths, right? We've been able to listen a lot. And we take that feedback very seriously so much that we act on it. We change things. We have discussions at the executive team level and say, should we be accelerating things on our roadmap? Should we be changing anything? Are these things one-offs or are they starting to sound like trends? So for example, our aggregation. I'm going to go back about five years ago and say that connections breaking was one of the top challenges that we heard from our advisors. So we committed to solve this. So now about 90% of our aggregated sources rely on APIs. Service tickets dropped by more than 70%. Call volumes are down by half. And our aggregation was rated the best in the industry by the T3 survey. So I feel like we took the bull by the horns and said, this is frustrating to our advisors. We need to find a way to solve it. We put a team against it. And we were able to enjoy really good results. It's, so, a, great, it's a great sorry. answer. No, that's a, I think that's a fantastic answer. Obviously, we've seen a number of changes. I like how you answered it through the lens of your own company, but then also the clients that your company serves. Can I double click into that? When you talk about client satisfaction, are you referring to financial advisors as your clients or the end clients of those advisors or both? I'm referring to both. The CSAT scores that we use and measure are from our direct buyers. So really the advisors, their mm-hmm. satisfaction with the money. But we see the pull through on that, right? The advisors who use the money and the advisors who create financial plans are more successful, period. They yeah. drive more assets under management. They have more, they have happier end clients as a result of that kind of collaborative experience. So effectively both. But when I talk about our CSAT, the folks that we are out there measuring against, it's the exact client who buys from us. There's no question that there's validity to the notion that planning and advisors who do planning are more successful. I think about this through the lens of the wirehouses because they've obviously been the most vocal And this probably even predates your e-money time. You think back 10 years, they've been vocal for years that advisors should be effectively planners first, right? Planning centric practices And obviously that's not partially that's because I think they believe in the importance of the mission of planning, but it's also because they view it as to your point, the secret sauce of what makes advisors more successful. Yeah. And I think that's true. We hear it and we see it all the time. And so we spend a lot of time with large enterprises focusing on how to drive continued adoption Mm -hmm. within the organization. And we have tools and resources to help them do that. We've got incredibly high adoption in some places and in others, they're echoing verbatim what you just said. We know that we can help our advisors grow the business. How do we make sure they're planning more frequently or how do we make sure that they're doing, thinking about these conversations differently because ultimately they'll then create a plan. They'll have a happier client. They'll be able to drive up their assets under management. And it just, it goes in a, a circle of success. Yeah, I think that's right. So I have to ask this question because as you're talking, I'm thinking through when we speak with advisors, one of the comments I find myself making these days more than ever is how crowded the landscape has become. And I'm referring more to firms and models and platforms. So meaning if you're a $10 million advisor, let's say $10 million in revenue, you basically have unlimited choice. You could go to a wirehouse, a regional, a boutique firm, an RIA. You could start your own RIA, an independent broker dealer, a roll up, a private equity firm. So there's a million different flavors or or models that you might realistically plug into. But I think that's true on the tech side as well. We see, I'm sure you've seen it, like the Michael Kitsis fintech map. And it's an incredibly crowded, convoluted landscape of tech. Is that a good thing or is it the pendulum has swung too far and there's too much choice out there and it needs to be narrowed? Oh my gosh, that map is dizzying, isn't it? We keep (laughs) getting updates every month on LinkedIn. 
I agree. Obviously, so many options. You can't be all things to all people and do all of it well. Just my opinion. But I, I do look at us as the leader in planning. And we know that we do all we can to help advisors and firms weave planning into all that they do. And we know what we're really good at. So regardless of all of the other options out there, we want to continue to evolve and advance and maintain our position as that leader in planning. That's what success means for us. It doesn't matter how many other platforms come and go. The game I play with myself when the new map comes up, I'm like, Who's not on here that was on? <laughs> Morbid. How is his chain? Right, exactly. But also new categories, niche upon niche. You start seeing a level of specificity on there that is dizzying. And we're hearing, at least at the higher end of our enterprises, folks want to consolidate their technology and their technology vendors. It's very difficult to be able to manage I know we have this challenge internally at eMoney. There's always new tech coming out. We always want to assess it and make sure that we are using the best of the best. But when I think of it in the context of our own brand, we know that planning is our hub, is our core, and we still have a lot of room to grow and help our clients grow over the years by continuing to focus here. Yeah. And I think that answer works really nicely because it's such a core function of it's something that's always going to be important to advisors, even more so going forward. And I agree with your answer. There is so much niche upon niche technology out there. I almost think of it like when we speak with advisors, the choice is a wonderful thing. Obviously having maximum choice and open architecture and freedom to cobble together your tech stack is a good thing. But more often than not, the feedback we hear is that choice may have gone a little bit too far in the sense that not only do advisors not want to have to figure out how to cobble it together, but even just vetting it, like how do you even decide which CRM and which rebalancer? I won't say which financial planner because we know exactly which financial <laughs> planning software. Because we know the best one there. <laughs> <laughs> that seems to be more and more the consensus. While choice is a good thing, that only extends so far. And it, it's probably true that some of it, and to your point, this is, I think, why you see the, that Kitsis map changes so often because the landscape just changes that often. It does. It's hard to keep up with it. And I think for us, making sure that we stay focused on the client's needs, we hear this all the time when we are out there talking with advisors and the dizzying tech in the space, and they don't want to manage all these different vendor relationships. And so we're like, well, we can help you grow, right? We'll grow with you. And that's part of the evolution that's occurred in our conversations over the past couple of years is learning from that and going back and saying, our clients want more customization. They want more flexibility that we need the premium APIs. We need these ways that they can then pull apart and use what they would find most beneficial to be able to scale their companies for growth. So more customization, more flexibility, and certainly still planning focused. I think it's pretty clear that's your roadmap over the next, call it 10 years. Tell me what else. So where does eMoney go three, five, and 10 years from now beyond a continued focus on planning, which I think, by the way, is a great thing that you have no plans of leaving what has made you so successful and continue to say that is going to be the core focus of our business going forward. Yeah. Well, in 10 years, hopefully I'll be somewhere in Italy. I don't know. <laughs> but for three to five, I can definitely give you a, a visual on to that. We're going to continue to raise the bar for our products and services and offer even more capabilities for advisors. So we turbocharged that in the past, I would say, 24 to 36 months in terms of releasing functionality that has been responsive, that has been proactive based on the conversations we've been having, and really focusing on collaboration across the board. You referenced it before, but it's very meaningful for us in our culture money. The collaboration goes not just with our clients, but collaborating with our employees, really focusing on our people and doing all that we can to make sure that employee engagement stays high and that our employees feel valued. As far as collaborating with our clients, retention, always a top priority for us. Ensuring these relationships that we have today are there for the long term, that we understand how our clients want to grow their business and that we can work with them to offer new solutions to help them do that. And then collaborating across the industry. This is something I would tell you is part of 
every week that I have here at eMoney is trying to understand and look across the industry, where can we maybe add more integrations or tools that will help our advisors streamline their workflows and create more efficiencies for them in the planning process. Yeah. All right. That's a, it's a great answer. And I, by the way, I'm going to be calling you off of that beach in 10 years to revisit how some of these, <laughs> how some of these predictions did. And I know it's incredibly hard to forecast one year, let alone three or five, but it's interesting to hear. So it sounds like the next chapter is call it incremental innovation, because I, I think the reality is, at least in the experience we have in talking with advisors, you're delivering largely on the promise of what advisors need. So why reinvent that wheel? Is that how you view your role? This is working. And so why are we going to mess with the secret sauce? Yeah, I think one way to go one step beyond that is to continue to understand what collaboration means with the end client to a certain extent. So part of that is continuing to conduct research and understand what's important today in our changing environment for investors so that we can, in fact, attract more people into a planning process, help the advisors continue to demonstrate their value through planning so that more people out there think, you know what, I really should talk to a financial planner, regardless of their income, their age, or any of these other identifiers. When we say our vision is financial peace of mind for all, that's what we mean. And I think there's definitely been a shift over the past couple of years in the approach to that and the propensity to plan for those that think I don't have tons of assets, I don't need to spend my time talking with a financial planner or financial advisor. And we're slowly beginning to see that change in the landscape where people realize you don't have to be a multimillionaire to have a plan. I'm curious. So I, I get that through the lens of the client. Not every end client might understand the need for a financial plan. Do you still find that you have to educate advisors? Like maybe I'm naive, but I would think all advisors, even if they're not currently doing this in a meaningful way, they at least know how important planning is. Is that incorrect? Are there still advisors that you have to educate on this? I think there are still advisors that we have to educate. Not, I don't think that every advisor is not planning centric. And even the advisors who designate themselves as planning centric could probably still do more plans. It's a matter of spending the time and investing in what you think you need to help you grow your business. I don't think anybody disputes the fact that advisors who plan have more successful businesses and happier clients, period. That's probably the best way to say it, right? Is that advisors buy into that premise, then it's only a matter of time before the adoption of it picks up or continues to pick up because the reality is, especially, look, it's one thing in a continued bull market, fine, maybe that the concept of adding growth via other channels is not all that important. But when the going gets tough, it certainly becomes even more critical. Absolutely agree. And I think one of the other things that we talk with advisors about is, well, how are you defining a plan? because the advisor defines it usually somewhat differently than their end client does. And to the end client, it can be daunting. But to the advisor, that plan can just be some of these intro conversations that help understand, I just have one goal. I really want to focus on paying for college for my kid. That could be it. And sitting there and collaborating, but again, having the tools that you need. I love that we're an enabler that you can pull up Decision Center and have this conversation with your clients and show them things in a very simple way and let them say, well, I'm not really sure. Maybe I want to retire earlier and maybe I do want to get a beach house and all of these things. But you know, whether it's visualizing it or at least instigating the conversations, recognizing the benefit of sitting down and collaborating with your client, it's always going to have a positive result. Yeah, I totally agree. And I just thought of this question. Does your team help advisors with the implementation? Is there almost like a para planning team within eMoney? And I think about that through the lens of probably not the wirehouse advisor because they have so much of that resource in-house. But if I'm somebody who just wants to go out and start my own wealth management firm, an RIA, and I want to use eMoney, do you guys provide resources to support those advisors? We have plenty of resources and planning and in coaching and in training. We also have a financial planning group. We've got P's on staff at the organization that work a lot with our clients. Some of our clients are standing up planning desks with para planners and we help them, whether it's train the trainer, whether it's do extensive 
scoping and onboarding of what they're trying to achieve, we're very fortunate that we have resources on staff that can help them do that. That's great. All right. This next question scares me a little bit, holistically, that is. I have to ask, (laughs) though, artificial intelligence. It feels like AI, artificial intelligence, is the next wave or the next major disruptor, probably in the wealth management industry as a whole, but certainly in the tech sphere of the wealth management industry. Give me your thoughts on AI and how it will impact your business going forward, if at all. Well, I made it to 1030 on a Thursday without talking about AI. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) Obviously, I think AI is going to impact every industry in some way. For us, obviously, we want to show how can AI most efficiently support planning. Our head of technology, Nick DeLisi, has a team in place that's already exploring this. But we know regardless of how it may make the planning process more efficient, this is still a personal business, right? It's based on relationships. AI can't offer that. We saw this when the robos came onto the scene years ago and people were very concerned about it replacing the financial advisor. I think we've gone in the opposite direction. We've reaffirmed why it's critical to have these conversations and have these relationships. And it's very liberating for our advisors when they break through with a client who maybe felt uncomfortable talking about this or has reached a point in their journey or had a life change that requires a pivot in their plan. So AI for sure. And we see real-time application, both e-money internally as well as our development team looking at other ways that we can help create greater efficiency while at the same time, never ever going to seek to replace the collaboration and the personal relationships. I'm glad you ended there on that note because, and you brought it up. I love that you mentioned robos. Like how many times has the financial advisor quote unquote died through the years? Right. Or at least the media has <laughs> written them off, right? Like the DOL rule, the robo advisors. And you're exactly right that every time Not only, actually, I would actually argue that it strengthens the position of the advisor. And I think AI will certainly fit that bill where at its best, it's not replacing the advisor. It should be a tool to supplement the advisor, right? Just like e-money is a tool to make an advisor better, AI becomes a bolt-on that allows advisors to expand their toolkit. But I think this will always be a human-first industry. Agreed? 1,000%. I think rumors of the death of this industry have been going on since long before I joined E-Money and definitely in my tenure here. And I just continue to watch this industry more with Marvel because I think it continues to help us achieve that long-term vision of financial peace of mind for all. Yeah, so I totally agree. I really agree with your point. So let's just tie a bow on this. Any final advice or wisdom to share with our audience? Again, primarily financial advisors, but this has been an absolute pleasure. So thank you so much for sharing all this great wisdom with us. Well, it's, can I say go birds? Absolutely. I'll allow it. (laughs) Did I mention that? I'm a huge Eagles fan. We might have to cut that that second one out. We'll allow one go birds, but. (laughs) Go birds. As far as wisdom, I I will say this. I learn every single day. I love it. Our clients, our employees, they teach me so much and it makes my role so fulfilling. And that's probably one piece of advice that I'd like to share. There is always more to learn. And I'm really grateful for everything and all the wisdom that I've acquired in my career. But I do think sports, not to come back to this, but I will, can teach us a lot too. I mentioned Loyal Eagles fan, once, twice, thrice, and say what you will about Jalen Hurts, but I do think he's offered a lot of one-liners that apply outside of sports. So I will end with a quote of his that I think really speaks to our approach here at E-Money. It might be a good reminder for advisors. Keep the main thing. For us, that's planning. And we're going to continue to raise the bar for planning in this industry. I love it. Even though it was Jalen Hurts, I love it. Thank you so much, Susan. This was fantastic. We'll have to have you on again in the future. Thank you, Jason. It was an absolute pleasure. As a financial advisor, you hold yourself to the highest standards of integrity, honesty, and credibility. You are successful because you take your professional responsibilities seriously and are dedicated to your clients. 
but are you living your best business life? Are your goals aligned with your firms or could a better option exist? Should I Stay or Should I Go is a book written with you in mind. It's a self-guided journey that walks you through the key steps that we take with our advisor clients. This strategic thought process and roadmap to professional self-discovery is designed to help you ask the right questions and think critically and objectively, whether you're considering change or not. Learn how to get your copy at diamond-consultants.com slash the book.